I don't know, it's interesting. I've known you for obviously all through all of those two things, and um, I have no idea where I'm going now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that's not just me. <laughs> Hey everybody, it's John Lamerton here alongside my good friend and business partner, Mr. Jason Brockman. We are here for another episode of the Ambitious Lifestyle Business Podcast, where as always, it is our job to help you get more customers and make more money without just working harder. So without further ado, let's dive straight into this month's episode. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 54 of the AOB podcast and it's an exciting time for me now. Very exciting. Very exciting. This is the culmination of a what has been a 12 month project for me. So last August I was on holiday with the brief of plotting out some notes for a potential second book, a potential follow-up to big ideas for small businesses. And I took my note on my journal with me and I said to myself, well, if I've got some notes, then we'll do this. We'll do this thing. Um, four or five pages of notes later. And I went and did a Facebook live from Corfu and said, looks like I'm writing the second book. Um, committed never writing to it. again, are we? Never writing never a book. Writing that was what I said. I'm never <laughs> doing another book. And here we are, um, 11 months later, and the book is coming out this month. So uh, if you are listening to this episode before the 11th of July, uh, it's not out yet. If you're listening to this episode after the 11th of July, hopefully <laughs> it's available to buy now. It's a bestseller. It's had hundreds of reviews. Um, it's been picked up by Richard and Judy. Richard and Judy still do books. I punch and Judy. Punch and Judy. <laughs> What I will say, guys, is if you would like to get a sample chapter of the new book, um, just, well, actually, I'll tell you what the book's called. I was going to ask you, actually. I was going to say, actually, what is the new book? So the new book is called Routine Machine. It's all about the power of routine. Um, Not just morning routines, but sort of successful strategies and daily habits um, to make you more successful. It's for business owners. It's kind of, it's, I'm... I'm positioning it as the follow-up to Big Ideas. So if Big Ideas was about focus, it was about um, doing the right thing, choosing the right action and the right thing to focus on. If Big Ideas is about choosing the right thing to focus on, Routine Machine is about focusing on the right thing or doing the right thing consistently, every time, habitually, Routinely, <laughs> there you go, you see. It, it is becoming a routine machine. Um, so if you'd like to see, um, I've put together a little sample chapter of the book, uh, which you can get, you can download at routinemachine.co.uk. Uh, that'll take you to the website where you can get yourself a free sample chapter. It's available now. So whether the book is available, uh, whether it's released or not, you can still get a free chapter of the book at routinemachine.co.uk. What we're also going to do for you today is I'm just going to, I'm going to read a few snippets for you. This is like a mini audiobook version for you. How cool is that? Do you know what? I spoke to someone today, just a little aside, I spoke to someone today, and they said to me that they only bought the audiobook of Big Ideas for Small Businesses read by pirates. after hearing my voice. <laughs> it was read by pirates. They made me audition for that. And I, he said, I only bought it because I listened to the voice and I thought, I like the sound of your voice. He likes the sound of his West voice. West Country well. <laughs> So here we go, guys. We're going to give you a few snippets from the book, uh, which is, I say it's coming out this month, Routine Machine. Get your free sample at routinemachine.co.uk. This is by John Lamerton. That's me. Hey, John Lamerton. Hey, Lamerton. He knows who you are. <laughs> are we there yet? I earned £13.51 for my first nine months in business. Nine months later, I quit my day job. Nine months after that, I was earning over 100 k a year. Warren Buffett bought his first stock in 1941. He was a millionaire by 1960 and surpassed the $1 billion mark in 1986. 19 billion of his $86 billion fortune has been made in the last two years. 
It's going to be a while before you see any feedback or results from any changes you're going to make now. When I replaced my go-to lunch of beans on toast with a healthy green juice, I saw absolutely no effect on the first day, or the second, or third. But 30 days later, and you could see the difference. A year later, and I looked like a different person. There's always a delay between the routine change and the feedback. That's perfectly normal and is to be expected. Remember, you are the compound effect of every decision you've ever made and every action you've ever taken. Those tiny flakes, the little habits and routines that on their own seem so small and insignificant when rolled down the hill of time yield massive snowballs. So are we there? Yes, then that's, that, that's actually an interesting concept because I think when you, even when you start doing stuff, like you might want to lose some weight and you go to the swimming world or wherever that, that, that kind of thing is, you kind of expect instant rewards, don't you? You yeah. expect instant, oh, I'm going to lose this much yeah. over this first week, it's going to be brilliant. And, uh, and it doesn't kind of work out all that well, does it? Yeah, no, I had a salad yesterday, so why haven't I lost two pounds today? I went to the gym yesterday and it's kind of like, oh, I should be having a body like Adonis, shouldn't I? <laughs> and it is, it is that delay between um, the action and the feedback. And, you know, I mean, health and weight loss is, is the, the obvious one because there is a massive delay. There's, there's at least a like, two-week lag between what you do and the, the long-term effect on you. Again, so it's been you know, take away from health. Fitness. You things like overpaying on your mortgage, for example. Actually, you could put another hundred pounds off. Take you know, add add an extra hundred pounds to your thing. It doesn't make any difference this month or next month or five months time or ten weeks, ten months time or three years time. But actually, over five years, that extra money that you paid off there completely relooks. Uh, re, re, you know, you save so much time and pay back your mortgage and stuff like that, don't you? Yeah, and it, it works for negative routines as well. So. You know, you could, I don't know, say, have a, have a KFC for lunch. Mm. Have a KFC for lunch today, fine. Have a KFC for lunch once a month, fine. Have a KFC once a week for lunch, okay, that's going to start actually impacting you and you're going to notice a difference, but you're not going to notice a difference having a KFC every week. Four weeks later, you're not going to notice a difference. Four months later, oh, stairs are getting a bit harder to walk up now. Four years later, and oh, where did that extra two stone come from? came from the one weekly routine, which that's only a KFC every now and then. Mm -hmm. um, these things really do compound and they do add up, but you have to allow time for the feedback loop to come back into action. The morning routine doesn't matter. I've got my own morning routine. It's personal to me and it works for me. You may well hate trying to copy my routine into your schedule and your life. Your routine doesn't have to start at 7.24 a.m. or 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. You choose, ideally based on your circadian rhythm. You may not have or want to take your kids to school. You may want to hit the gym or get straight to work, meditate or read, do yoga or go for a run, make some phone calls, read the newspaper, meet friends for breakfast. Whatever you want to do, it's your routine. The important thing isn't getting up at 5 a.m. Unless you're an early bird, and you want to, of course. The important thing is having a routine when you do wake up. I remember when I was just starting out in business, I used to read the profile of a successful businessman or woman in the Sunday papers each week. The format was the same every week. Hmm, where have I heard that before? It was a day in the life of whoever. Every week, in just about every profile, their day would start in a very similar way. 5 a.m., wake up. Coffee, hit the gym. 4.30 a.m., alarm goes off, go for a run. 4 a.m., got to wake up before everyone else does. It seemed there was a clear pattern here. All these successful people get up at silly o'clock in the morning, get some exercise, and are in the office by 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. Bugger. As an in-betweener, I've got no chance. I now know that the most important thing is having a morning routine, full stop. Not one that starts in the middle of the night and makes you look superhuman to readers of a Sunday newspaper, but one that works for you. A morning routine that does all the heavy lifting and sets you up in the best possible way to hit the ground running when you land at your desk. 
Even if it starts at 11 a.m. with have a cup of coffee and watch TV, if that's what sets you up for a really productive, high energy day, then go for it. If you'd be happier setting your alarm for 4 a.m., doing a kettlebell workout and being first in the office, good for you. It's your routine. You choose. Richard Branson gets up at 5.45 a.m. every morning. Winston Churchill didn't get out of bed until 11 a.m. If you want new results, you need new routines, but they've got to work for you. Copying someone else's just isn't going to help in the slightest. The routine doesn't matter. What matters is that you have a routine. I think that's a really important um, lesson, really, because routines are routine, but they're your routines. Mm. And if for two reasons, I guess, if you don't follow the routine that works for you, you're not going to follow the routine. You're not going to stick to it. Yeah, straight out the window. <laughs> And two, because everybody lives their lives differently and everybody has other things which can interfere with their routines, um, whether that's the children or the pets or the yep. wife or the, or the girlfriend or boyfriend or whoever, whatever it is, there's always something that's going to interfere. So actually building your own routine and having that consistently throughout gives you that growth. It does. I mean, I talked earlier in, in the book about when I tried someone else's morning routine let's get up at 5 a.m let's do a workout let's do some meditation let's do some affirmations let's have a healthy smoothie and all that ended up with was the entire house being woken up me being shattered and like being back in bed by 11 o'clock it just didn't work for me um and i said i remember going back to those sunday newspapers and just reading every week it was the same thing wake up early hit the gym you know get my power lunch in and my power walk in and and I'm in the office ready to work at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. And I'm thinking, well, I don't want to get out of bed before 8 in the morning. What, what's going on here? I'm, I'm clearly not made for this. I'm not, you know, I'm not cut out for this. Life. It's actually, you know, the, you get Winston Churchill, 11 a.m. He'd get out of bed. And actually, most of the time, he wouldn't get out of bed. He'd just stay in bed writing <laughs> um, and drinking. Everyone is different. <laughs> and you have to customize your routines, as you said. If they're not your routines, you're not going to stick to them. People think, oh, Richard Branson gets up at 5.45 a.m. Therefore, if I want to have a successful business like Sir Richard, the alarm needs to be set for 5.45 a.m. No, it doesn't matter what time. If Richard Branson gets up at 11 a.m., I guarantee he gets just as much done in the day as he otherwise would. But 5.45 is what works for him. And you've got well, to customize you it. Want those lovely sunrises, wouldn't you? Do you know what? We are recording this in the summer and I've got to say, I am waking up a lot earlier because it's your natural circadian rhythm. You wake with the sun, you go down with the sun, you know. That's the interesting thing actually, is about the circadian rhythm. Is actually, there's a lot of science involved as well. It's mm. not just a case of actually, I have to do what I say because it's the right thing to do, but actually there's a whole of science to kind of back up yeah. the fact that you kind of need those things. I was saying, I mean, there are three types of people and you've got your early birds, you've got your in-between, I identified myself as an in-betweener and you've got your night owls. So, just about every techie, every coder we've ever employed is without a doubt a night owl. You know, I, I'm saying hi to Lee now, who's our sound engineer, who I can never reach until three o'clock in the afternoon because that's when he starts work. <laughs> He's happily working till midnight. Now, I can't stay awake till midnight, but he does his most productive work in the evening. Now, so you've got Richard Branson, who is most productive at 6 a.m., 7 a.m. You've got our sound guy, who's most productive at you know, seven in the evening, you've got me, I do my best work late morning. It's like, well, how can you have a one size fits all routine for all three of us? You can't. You, and it's about playing to your strengths. We're all individuals. Who are you? Who are you? When you change your routines, you don't just change what you do. You change who you are. As Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. From 1994 to 2006, I was a smoker. The record books, if there was such a thing for smoking, would show that I had my first cigarette on something like July the 20th, 1994, with my final toke coming on April 12th, 2006. Does that mean that I went to bed on July 19th, 1994, a non-smoker, and woke up the following morning as a smoker? No, of course not. If you'd asked me on that fatal day that I took my very first drag, whether I was now a smoker, I'd have laughed at you. Of course I wasn't a smoker. I just had one little cigarette. Even two weeks later, I wouldn't have classed myself as a smoker. Sure, I'd had a couple every Friday and Saturday night, 
but I was still a non-smoker. That's who I was. And then there's a blurry line, somewhere between that just a couple at the weekend to 20 a day, from non-smoker to smoker. The change didn't happen overnight. It happened over time as I changed. It was the same when I quit. I still classed myself as a smoker for several months afterwards, despite not partaking of a single puff. I was a smoker who hadn't had a cigarette for a few months. Then one day, the story changed in my head. I'm a smoker who's trying to quit became I'm an ex-smoker. And then eventually, I don't smoke. I changed. My routines changed months before, but it took an age for my thinking and realisation about who I was caught up. The story you tell yourself and who you believe you are is half the battle. I found giving up drinking really easy compared to giving up smoking. I believe that's because of the story I told myself about who I was. When I gave up smoking, I thought of myself as a smoker who was trying to quit for several months. Yet when I gave up drinking, I didn't want to drink from day one. A person who doesn't want to drink finds it easy to say no to a drink. A smoker who is trying to quit is still a smoker and has to use willpower to say no. I don't have to use willpower to say no to cigarettes now because who I am has changed. I'm a non-smoker now. People who don't smoke don't want cigarettes. People who don't drink don't want to get drunk. I haven't eaten at McDonald's for 10 years or more, and my kids have never eaten there. I used to enjoy a quarter pound of cheese at least once a week, but now I can't think of anything less appetizing. What changed? I did. I don't eat at McDonald's. That's just who I am now. McDonald's didn't change. I did. What you repeatedly do or don't do makes you who you are. When you change who you are, it makes creating and sticking to routines congruent to your goals much easier. If your goal is to become healthy, ask yourself, is this the routine of a healthy person? If you want to be more productive, ask, is this what a productive person would be doing right now? If you want to be a better leader, what would a great leader do in this situation? Every time you ask what the person you want to become would do, and then model that behavior yourself, you inch one step closer to becoming that person, to changing who you are. We are what we repeatedly do. Do what the person you want to be would repeatedly do, and you'll become them. That's really interesting because uh, actually taking on a routine is, is all about mindset. At least that, that that sample chapter there kind of kind of really released that really about actually the belief in what you kind of really want to be doing, then actually you're not going to want to do it, and therefore you won't do it. Exactly. The the ex smoker has the routines of someone who used to smoke. A non smoker has the routines of someone who doesn't smoke, and a smoker who is trying to give up has the routines of a smoker who is trying to give up, and it, it makes it so the mindset is completely different. And my shift between giving up the smokes and giving up the booze was polar opposite because I literally, when I, when I go up to smoking, like, I still love smoking. I still really enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm just giving up because it bloody costs too much. And I, I, there's that immediate, right, what I need to actually do this and to achieve this is willpower. Whereas when I immediately said to myself, I don't want to drink, I was like, okay, I don't want to drink. So it makes it much easier to have the routines of a non-drinker when I don't want to drink. It's not about the bike. British cycling used to be a bit of a joke. Us Brits would be bringing up the rear, huffing and puffing our way up the mountain, well behind the leaders. Hopes of Olympic glory and Tour de France wins were but a dream. Enter Sir Dave Brailsford. Sir Dave joined the British cycling team in 1997 and became performance director in 2003. The following year, Team GB won four medals at the Olympics in Athens including gold medals for Bradley Wiggins and Chris Hoy. It was their best performance in 96 years. Four years later, at the 2008 Games in Beijing, they would pick up a record 14 medals, including eight golds. Having seen what Sir Dave's methods had done for Team GB, he was persuaded to join Team Sky and head up their road cycling team, with a view to replicating his success on the grandest cycling stage of them all, the Tour de France. 
a race that no Brit had ever won and which was widely accepted as the world's toughest bike race. Riders compete over a three-week period, covering more than 3,500 kilometres of gruelling climbs, with competitors often having to ascend multiple mountains in a single day, from altitudes of a few hundred feet above sea level to more than 3,000 feet, whilst racing against your fiercest competitors in 30-degree heat. It took Sir Dave just two years to work his magic, with Bradley Wiggins becoming the first Brit to win the Tour de France in 2012, the same year that another 12 cycling medals were picked up by Team GB at the London Olympics, including another go to Wiggins, who became Sir Bradley as a result. As if to prove that it was no fluke, Team Sky won the race again in 2013, this time Chris Froome wearing the yellow jersey. Froome would go on to notch up four Tour de France victories, including three in a row from 2015 to 2017, the first rider to do so since Lance Armstrong, who of course had his own methods to give him the edge over his rivals. As I write this, Team Sky have won six of the last seven Tour de France competitions, and Team GB have notched up 42 Olympic cycling medals in the last four games, including 24 golds. Not bad for a laughing stock. So, what was the secret to Dave Brailsford's success? Did he have a golden generation of athletes, all perfectly suited to be the best in the world at cycling? Did he stumble across a new bike that went faster than anyone else's? Nope. In Sir Dave's own words, it's not about the bike. What Brailsford did was have a technique that he referred to as the aggregation of marginal gains. What the hell does that mean? It may sound complicated, but it's actually a pretty simple idea. While everyone else is focused on getting world class at a small number of things, like building bigger muscles, improving stamina, and making the bikes more efficient and reliable, Dave and his team would break down the big, unachievable goal, winning a Tour de France or an Olympic gold medal, into each individual element that could help or hinder them. They then look to improve each of those elements by just 1%. The whole principle came from the idea that if you broke down everything you could think of that goes into riding a bike and then improved it by 1%, you will get a significant increase when you put them all together, said Brailsford in 2012. The bike went into a wind tunnel to improve aerodynamics by 1%. He insisted everyone in the team used antibacterial hand gel to cut down illness and infections by 1%. The team bus was redesigned to improve recuperation by 1%. When he discovered dust accumulating on the floor of the mechanics truck, he had the floor painted pristine white, so it would be noticed 1% quicker. He employed psychologists to tease out 1% improvements in the athletes' mindsets. He redesigned the team's training suits and helmets, making them 1% more comfortable, reducing friction by 1%. Wicking sweat away 1% better and reducing air drag by 1%. So Dave went hunting for each and every one of the team's weaknesses. Those tiny opportunities that have been allowed to slide. And by correcting each one, he saw that desired 1% improvement and went hunting for the next marginal gain to be had. Whilst on the road to the Tour de France, he noticed that the entire team, not just the athletes, were getting more and more tired as the weeks rolled on. 23 nights of sleeping on different mattresses in different hotels would do that to you. So a new bus followed the team around, containing each person's preferred mattress and pillow. It's fair to say they slept more than 1% better as a result, and having every single member of the team firing on all cylinders throughout the gruelling three-week process cannot be underestimated. Super duper, like it. And this is, I think, probably out of the ones we've had so far, the uh, one which you can apply to your business. I think so. Um, or any, indeed, any aspect of your life. Um, people are often looking for the big sweeping changes. How can I, you know, lose five stone? How can I 10x my business? Um, how can I find that new relationship? And actually, there's so many opportunities for these small 1% gains. Um, I mean, I think the, the standout section, just as I was reading through there, um, obviously I'm talking here about 
to Dave Brailsford and talk about Team Sky, Team GB, but just apply this sentence to your own life. Those tiny opportunities that had been allowed to slide and by correcting each one and seeing that desired 1% improvement. I mean, there's so many areas that we could all be 1% better in. And being 1% better isn't difficult. Now, at Olympic standard, at professional athlete standard, being 1% better is quite hard Mm -hmm. because people are already pretty optimized. But for the average small businesses, marketing department, could they send 1% more emails over the course of the year? Probably. Could they you know, negotiate 1% better with suppliers? Could they be 1% better at selling? Could they put their increase their profit margins by 1%? Could they reduce their overheads by 1%? You know, the, making these small gains, which on their own, you would say, well, it's not worthwhile. But when they compound and you have this, this massive effect of all these multiple things, and it's, you know, what Sir Dave did with the British cycling team was to break it down into you know 50 or 100 different components and when you if you had 100 components and you improve each one by 1% you don't end up with a 100% improvement you end up with a 700% improvement because what it's not 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 3 it's 1 plus 1 plus 1 it's 1 multiplied by 1 which I know doesn't work for all the mathematicians out there but it you does compound. Yeah, you know, these things do. They they can they multiply because the time you factor in all of the team being more alert, the bikes being more efficient, the suits being more efficient, the recovery being quicker, less illness, better sleep, more rested. All these things compound to actually an extra three seconds um, on on the sprint. Being able to um, have the stamina to go up that climb and shave three minutes off per day. You know, these are the the little gains on its own. You know, the mechanics using hand gel on its own, if they were only to do that, makes absolutely no difference. But and it wasn't just hand gel. I mean, they actually had um, had surgeons come in and show them exactly how to wash their hands correctly, so making sure they're getting down into these little folds <laughs> and into the palm of the hand and all the bits that you don't get when you just wash your hands with soap. And they reduced sickness in the team, and that then meant that actually the team. And I say the team, not just the athletes, it was the whole team. So, you know, again, business owners often focus on themselves and the things that they can impact. But what if you can get your admin team working a little bit better? What if your customer service could be 1% better? What if you retained 1% more people or you got 1% more people to bring referrals in? I mean, this is what we do within the 1% Club. This is effectively our our 1% Club ethos, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's about having as Dave calls it, the aggregation of marginal gains, which is an awful title for a brilliant concept. Absolutely, yeah. And because they are so small, they're not unachievable. They're not something you can go and give up on because actually to make that 1% gain is is simple, it's easy. Um, And then do lots of those over a period of time routinely and you've got yourself in a good position exactly it's just set the routine of hunting for these opportunities and that's that's what Dave does now is he literally he loves the game of hunting for these opportunities because obviously a lot of what I've talked about here is now what Dave did seven, eight, nine years ago so he's pretty optimised so actually now he is literally hunting for these next 1% opportunities but I bet you in, a, in an average year I bet he still finds at least 50 one percent gains that you can just tweak this tweak that technology has moved on we can make this a little bit better and this it is such an easy routine um and it, you know all your routines are the compound for you or against you and if you're not making one percent gains to make things better it's very very easy to make one percent um negative routines which counts against you and actually you you may be better off cutting out the little shortcuts that you make in seven or eight different areas because that will again compound against you. We just decided to go. What's the hardest part about going for a run? Is it the aching afterwards, the tightness in your chest as you tire, getting a stitch, your lack of stamina, your jelly legs on hills, the time it takes to warm up, do the run and warm down? Nope. The hardest part of going for a run 
The one thing that stops most people from running is lacing up your trainers. Once your running shoes are on and tied, you're going to head out the door. You're going to warm up. You're going to push yourself. You're going to do this. As Jim Lovell, played by Tom Hanks, says in Apollo 13, watching Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landing on the surface of the moon in July 1969, from now on, we live in a world where man has walked on the moon. And it's not a miracle. We just decided to go. It just decided to go. That's the hard part. Deciding to go. Deciding to do. Deciding to do is the tipping point. I'm talking about truly deciding, making an absolute unbreakable contract with yourself that says, we are doing this. Lacing up those trainers, signing that contract, publicly stating that you're going to write a book. That last one is what I did in the summer of 2018. A year after my first book hit the bookshelves, and I declared many, many times that I would never write another book again. But this idea kept niggling me. All the success I've had and all the success I witness, so much of it comes down to routine, to simply doing the right things day in, day out. Jeff Woods made his king of routine comment on a podcast, and I found it harder and harder to resist the temptation to write another book. I needed to get off the fence and either do this or bury the idea forever. I'm not the sort of person who can keep an idea on ice for any length of time. As Yoda may or more likely may not say, do or do not, there is no maybe one day. We had a family holiday booked for the summer holidays, a fortnight in the sun with no work and zero responsibilities. I decided to use this downtime away from the hustle and bustle of everyday business life. Obviously, I don't allow a great deal of hustle or bustle in my everyday life anyway, and took my journal with me. My theory was thus. If I had a book in me, I'd be able to jot down loads of ideas. If I struggled to write down the basic chapter outline for this book, then I would consign the idea to the dustbin, never to see the light of day. After 90 minutes and three cappuccinos sat by the pool, I'd noted down almost 100 ideas. I'd filled page after page after page in my journal. Ping! Imagine a light bulb going off above my head at this exact moment. For this is the exact moment that it happened. I decided to write this book at that exact moment, sat by a swimming pool in Corfu with my fourth cappuccino next to me and the kids splashing in the pool. The one thing I needed to do now was to commit, to lace my trainers, to give me some public accountability. So I took out my phone, and went live on Facebook to our ambitious lifestyle business community, bigidea.co.uk forward slash Facebook. The title of my live video was, I might possibly have decided to write book number two. Of course, there was no possibly about it. Do or do not. My trainers were laced. It was several months before I wrote a single word of this book and almost a year before it became the finished article that you're listening to right now. This isn't the finished article, by the way. This is just a snippet, but you get the idea. But I took action immediately. Decide to go and put your trainers on. The rest will follow. One of my mentors used to preach about reducing the time between the idea and the implementation. And this is advice that served me well over the years. I don't have half-baked ideas floating around the place unfinished. I have an idea and I do it. Or I decide not to do it. But either way, I decide. And I act immediately after deciding. I take the very first step towards achieving my goal or I ditch the idea. Never to be seen again. Good idea. <laughs> if you're going to do it you've got to work on and do it and it's, uh, it's just one of those things that I think so many people like they have the idea and they say yeah I'll do that one day and just one day never comes and I think I mean I, I talked about this in big ideas but you know people have these plans for one day just lace trainers take the first step and do and I think if you can create that routine and you know, if, if it is going for a run and it is, you know, lacing your trainers, well, how how do you make that easy? Well, stick your trainers by the front door, mm-hmm. you know, uh, do the school run in your trainers, so that I just want to run back from there. It's it is taking that first step, and 
I think the the deciding to go, the deciding to do, it ties into um, what we're saying just now about the, the the person you are, the person you become. And the minute I decided to write this book, well, that book was almost written mm-hmm. because I decided to do it. Uh, you know, up until that point, I was contemplating writing a book. And I'm sure there'll be people listening to this podcast now who are contemplating writing a book and thinking, well, maybe one day I'll do that. Well, do or do not. There is no maybe one day, as Yoda probably doesn't say. <laughs> yes, he doesn't say that. <laughs> and I think, you know, adding to that toolbox, the, the public accountability, I think that, that also does it. Because once you've made the decision, there's nothing worse yeah. than telling everybody that you're going to do it and then you don't do it. So actually... You're going to do it, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. That's the that's the thing. <laughs> yeah, because ever since I did that Facebook Live, I, at least a couple of times a month, someone would say to me, "How's the book coming on?" Mm-hmm. And you know, I would say, "Oh, I'm at this stage, I'm at this stage." And for a couple of months, it was I haven't actually started it yet. Um, but that's the plan. The plan was to start it in like, November. I started writing it, mm-hmm. um, and that was always going to be the plan. But three months before that. I decided to do, I decided to go, you know, and uh, I really like that scene, let's say in, in Apollo 13, where Tom Hanks is kind of looking up at the moon and saying, yeah, we, we just decided to go. Um, I thought you could do a Forrest Gump, and that's what I thought you could do, and run about running, and uh, so I ran. Well, the forest ran. <laughs> so I ran, and I kept on running. <laughs> I thought you were going to be doing that. That's what I thought. But there we are. Oh, we see, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get yeah. in this podcast. Exactly. So it says something a little bit different for you this month, guys. Hope you've enjoyed that. Um, if you have enjoyed these little snippets uh, from Routine Machine, then don't forget you can get yourself um, a free sample chapter at routinemachine.co.uk. Uh, and hopefully, uh, by the time you actually listen to this episode, we will be, uh, like I say, best selling once again. Um, you know, hundreds of reviews and be nice, wouldn't it? Lots, all, hopefully, lots of people enjoying the book and actually finding it useful and changing those routines. And I think if just it. if we can get one takeaway from the whole thing, it is that it's not about morning routine. I know lots of people focus on morning routine when it comes to routines, but it is about the little habits you do. It's about those one percent gains. It's about building blocks, isn't it? And yeah. you know, for, for lots of people who are preaching about routines and stuff, it's about getting the foundations right in the morning, waking up properly and that, but that's not what it's about at all. It's about doing these little things, putting those blocks together to create that routine. Yeah. I think the why people like the morning routine is because it's starting the day in the right way and it's lacing your trainers. And if your trainers are laced, you're going out for the run. If you start the day right, you finish the day right. Whereas actually, if you don't start the day right, what well, you've got to find time to go to the gym, or you've got to find time to do that, write that sales letter, or write that productive email, or have that conversation with that member of staff, um, and just creating those routines. I so, say, I mean, I, yeah, I'm the king of routine. You know, we've um, we've talked about this before in a, in a previous podcast, um, but you don't need to take things to the level I do with routine where. You know, I'd live and die by my routine. It's I'm very, very. Um, we all live and die by his routine. It's true. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I'm very, very persistent about it, and I completely crave routine. Um, it's a lovely chapter in the book about why I hate Christmas, which is um, fun about routine. But you don't have to take it to that level. Um, and one of the points I will make in the book is you've already got a routine. Um, you just need to realise that you have a routine now and it is within your control to, to just tweak it and make, this 1%, make a few little changes, changes, make the marginal gains, add them up, and then you too will have a knighthood and a gold medal and win the Tour de France. If you want to. If you want to. But you do have to lace the trains. You've got to lace the trains. Actually, you know, cleats is the answer for cycling. Was it? Yeah, you don't need lace trains. Cleats is where you stamp the thing on the thing. Go off then. Anyway, cheers, guys. See you later. Bye. So there we are, another episode in the can. Um, how was it for you? Please let us know. Um, How you listen to these podcasts? Uh, please leave a review on that platform. Let us know what we can do better, what you like, what you don't like, and how we can improve to make this show even better for you. We'll see you next time.